Siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I love Peter. I love Peter because of how often he misses the point. He often seems to be on an entire series of what Tony Campola would call adventures in missing the point, which lets me feel better about myself when I have some new revelation or realization and have to acknowledge that I was wrong about something, when I realize that I had missed the point about something, I can think about Peter and not feel so bad. Now, if we were going line by line through the good news according to Matthew, we would have just read the passage where Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. First century Jews were hoping for a Messiah, God's anointed one who would rescue them from the Romans. Peter, having correctly grasped that Jesus is the Messiah, has a whole bunch of assumptions about what that means about Jesus. Most likely, Peter thought Jesus was or would be some kind of political or military leader, maybe a religious leader, who would inspire and lead a revolt against the Romans. So when Jesus tells his disciples that he will be opposed by the Sadducees and the Pharisees and that he will be killed in Jerusalem, Peter doesn't get it. This is completely outside first century Judaism's understanding of who the Messiah would be and what he would do. As Pastor Clay Schmidt, who taught at Fuller and at our denomination's Southern Seminary, has pointed out, this is completely contrary to the hope and expectation of Israel. The Messiah would not go to his death in Jerusalem. And it would make no sense in first century Judaism that the Messiah would give up his life at just the moment that he should be seizing leadership of Israel. And Peter can't grasp it. It's so shocking that Peter misses the conclusion of what Jesus is telling the disciples. And on the third day, be raised to life. So Peter completely misses the point and then jumps in to tell Jesus not to let it happen. Peter here, I'm sure, was speaking for all of the disciples. And for that matter, he's speaking for us today. Because like Peter, we too often have our minds set not on divine things, but on human things. We say that Jesus is the Messiah. We even often call him by the title Christ, which is the Greek word for Messiah or anointed one. But how often do we think in human terms about human things and miss the promise of resurrection and new life? Even while saying that Jesus rose from the dead, how often do we miss the implication this has for our lives? It's easier to imagine a Jesus who was a great moral teacher, which he was, a great leader, which he was, or even a miracle worker, than it is to comprehend that he would be lifted up on a cross in a way that would draw all humanity to himself and then rise from the dead. We too often think and function on a human level. Our materialist, individualist, secular consumer society creates our default settings. It's like the air that we breathe or the water we swim in, and we often don't even realize, we don't realize how much it's involved in setting our expectations. But this passage from Matthew can reset our habits of mind, our habits of action, the habits of our hearts. This passage encourages us to think of Jesus as more than a moral example. We often say things like, if Jesus was willing to die for you, shouldn't you live for him? That's not a bad argument. It makes some sense. It's not wrong. But if we stop there, we risk reducing Jesus in our minds to a moral leader and we miss the true power of Jesus' death and resurrection. You've heard the question, what would Jesus do? 
often abbreviated as WWJD. If we're talking about ethics, that's not a bad question, although probably none of us are going to rise from the dead, which might give us some different answers to or approaches to how we ask and answer that question. But how should we act toward other people is a really good question. But this passage in Matthew 16 demands that we reset our habit of thinking about human things. Yes, Jesus' death is an example of what it means to love others because it was motivated by God's love for the world. But Jesus' death, coupled with his resurrection, is much more, it's much more than a moral example. Jesus' death and resurrection revealed the incomprehensible power of God to change the world. Jesus conquers the powers of sin, death, and evil in this world, and he offers to set us, to set you and to set me free from everything that would keep us separate from him or our neighbors. Jesus makes possible new life filled by the Holy Spirit in the power of the resurrection, which enables us to live differently by God's values instead of by the standards of our culture or society. Did you catch that line at the end of this passage where Jesus says that some people standing there and listening to him will still be alive when God's kingdom comes? If we think that means Jesus returning on a cloud like the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, then Jesus was wrong or Matthew unfortunately reported it incorrectly. But Think about what God's kingdom means. God's will being done in the world. People living by God's values instead of the value of our earthly societies. Say this line with me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's kingdom is God's values being lived out on earth. If we had read on into Matthew chapter 17, we would have come to the event known as the Transfiguration, where three of Jesus' disciples go with him up a mountain, and they see a vision of Jesus, Moses, and Elijah talking to each other. And Jesus' appearance has been transfigured or changed. That event is a foreshadowing or a prefiguring of the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus enters Jerusalem as a king on the day we call Palm Sunday. And think about the crucifixion and the resurrection. Jesus is declared a king on the cross by Pilate. And he defeats the power of evil when he rises. In Acts chapter 2, Peter says that God made Jesus Lord by raising him from the dead. God's kingdom comes when Jesus goes to the cross and rises. Or, think about the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. This is the beginning of the church. And your life changes, your life changes, when the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, comes into your life and Christ now lives in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom comes again and again and again. Now, Peter may have thought, he may have thought that Jesus the Messiah would set Israel free from Rome. But Jesus had a much bigger agenda, which drove him to the cross, so that he could rise. And that death and resurrection was part of God's plan. As we enter into Holy Week, in which we will have services on both Good Friday and Easter Sunday, it is good to remember that Jesus' death was part of God's plan. As New Testament scholar Eugene Boring points out, the call to discipleship is based on faith in Christ and confidence in the victory of God. It is not merely a matter of high human ordeals or noble principles. Jesus was a great moral teacher, but he was more than that. 
the life that Jesus calls us to is not based on our reason conclusion about, thi- about how things are in the world. And it's not based on our observation or general principles. The life that Jesus calls us to is based on faith that something important, Jesus' death and resurrection, has happened. And Jesus' death and resurrection changes everything. To believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and then to change our lives by striving to live according to his teachings means to reorient your life toward the good news that God has acted decisively and ultimately in Jesus. Peter likely also suspected that being a disciple of the Messiah would consist of strolling through the halls of power and prestige. In the human way of thinking, we might want to know the president or the governor, be on a first-name basis with our senator or congressperson, and be invited to important political events. People People pay huge sums of money. We call them political donations to have that kind of access to power. Expectations surrounding the Messiah would have been similar. When the Pharisees and Sadducees asked Jesus for a sign, they likely would have fallen in line with him quickly if he had given them the answer he hoped for. And then they would have prepared themselves to bask in the excess glory left in the Messiah's wake. But they didn't get the sign they asked for. Jesus was not that kind of leader, and that wasn't what he offered his followers. For the last several weeks, we've been in a series called Follow Me, where we're talking about what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus' announcement of the death that was awaiting him in Jerusalem points to anything but the glory of security, influence, or power. Instead of basking in glory, Jesus' followers are to deny themselves and take up their cross. Jesus' words to Peter, get behind me, remind us of the place of a disciple. We can't follow Jesus if we're in front of him. We follow by walking behind him. Jesus reminds Peter of the proper place of a follower. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus calls Simon Peter and other disciples to follow me and I will make you fish for people. Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 10, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Here in Matthew Matthew 16, Jesus says, If any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The meaning of discipleship, what it means to follow Jesus, is learned along the way. By Matthew chapter 16, the disciples have been following Jesus for quite some time. They have even been sent out to preach and heal. But now, now, only now, they are really beginning to learn the true meaning and cost of discipleship, which cannot be explained fully in advance, but has to be learned en route. We Christ followers may sometimes wonder about the integrity of our faith and our life when we realize that we didn't know what we were doing when we first came to faith or joined the church. But neither did Jesus' 12 closest disciples, who only now are beginning to learn what following Jesus means. And they will falter and fall before the story is over. This provides comfort to those of us who are concerned about past lapses or misunderstandings, and probably have more to come. On the other hand, it may be a warning to those who think they have it all figured out. We are all on a journey on which we are called to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. Now, to some degree, we Jesus followers take up our cross gladly. 
Maybe we sit on church committees that have boring meetings and we don't complain about it very much or very often. Maybe we give our time to projects or causes that help us live out the love ethic. Maybe we give more than our financial advisor might think is prudent. Maybe we even help out people who annoy us. We might be pretty good at bearing little crosses, but this passage encourages us, challenges us, and actually pushes us to go deeper. To take up your cross is to truly deny yourself, not to add some little taxations or inconveniences to a comfortable way of life lived by our society's standards. Pastor Shane Claiborne, for example, has said that his life was pretty good by human standards until he took seriously the Bible's language about following Jesus. Jesus asks us to live not by human standards, by our society's standards, but by his standards. Clayton Schmidt, again, suggests that most of us are pretty poor at cross-bearing. And Jesus' 12 disciples wouldn't have thought that they were any better at it than we are. Living under the rule of the Roman Empire, they had seen crosses that weren't religious symbols or jewelry. They had seen crosses that were instruments of death. And they knew how life-crushing they were. For them, the thought of carrying a cross was a life and death matter. And in the end, many of them died because they followed Jesus. At the end of John's Gospel, we see him talking to Peter in a way that actually predicts Peter's death. For us, carrying a cross is a metaphorical idea. Most of us don't expect to die in the process. But seriously denying ourselves, instead of taking on some minor inconveniences, seems like much, maybe too much to ask. We aren't much good at that either. But there is challenge and good news in this passage. First, if we follow Jesus, we will be seriously called to bear certain crosses and sacrifice pieces of our lifestyle, if not our very lives. Second, in all of our weakness and human-mindedness, our culturally conditioned expectations, Jesus' own death, together with his resurrection, enables us to do what we could not do on our own power. We may be able to do nothing, nothing at all, on our own power. We may be completely unable to actually walk with and follow Jesus. And we may be given too much to bear, but he will be with us and help us through. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. And in Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus promises to be with us always, even to the end of the age. The fact that we are following Jesus, who is always with us, and who has already faced the worst the world can do, he's faced death and overcome it, makes it possible for us to deny ourselves, take up our own cross, and follow. And Jesus strengthens us to bear the burdens of discipleship. He tells us to take his burden upon our shoulders, and his burden is light. We may not be able to accomplish anything on our own, but Jesus can do much through us. Without Jesus, with, without Jesus, Peter was a stumbling block. With Jesus' Holy Spirit, Peter was a great preacher and a leader in the early church. With Jesus, we are able to bear all that we may be given. Lloyd Ogilvy once put it this way, we say, but Lord, I cannot. And God says, I'm glad to hear you say that because through you, I can. Jesus puts his life on the line ahead of everyone who follows him. 
what might we be able to do for the sake of the world if we trusted in the promises of the one who goes ahead of us? Amen.